Anyways, we're going to uh, jump into things and, and wrap up a series this morning. And I want to encourage you all about this. We will be out next Sunday. And then the Sunday after that, which is January the 3rd, we're calling it Vision Day. And so just uh, make special plans to be here that day. Going to tell you a little bit about what we sense God is saying and doing as we go into a, a brand new year, 2016. Anyone excited about a new year? Yeah. It, listen, if you've had a rough 2015, the best thing I can tell you is it's almost over. <laughs> well, we're going to tell you what God's saying and uh, believe that uh, we have uh, some good things to, to share with you. So we, we've been on this series and to be really honest with you, all the way back in January, God told me what to speak on this year, and he said, I want you to do this series called Detox. I'm like, that's awesome. I had no idea what it was about. I had no idea what it would be about until we got to it here in, in December. And, and so um, he gave us this series called Detox. And detox basically just means the process of eliminating toxins from your, your physical body. And just in doing a little bit of research with that, I found these, these few benefits of detoxing, speaking physically here. First of all, um, it gives your organs a rest when you detox. It stimulates your liver to drive out toxins. It promotes elimination through your kidneys. It improves your circulatory system, and it refuels you with nutrients. Now, I'm obviously not here to give you a science or a biology lesson, but we're talking more of a spiritual detox. And I want you to think about that. If if the spiritual detox did some of the same things, how many could use a new fresh resting on, on you spiritually? How about uh, your, your spiritual life to be stimulated or some things to be eliminated from your life or your spiritual circulation to be improved? Or how about this, you're just being refueled with some healthy nutrients? So I believe when we get done with this message today, just like after a physical detox, you are a healthier person, I believe you could be spiritually healthier after this series, by, by the time we're, we are, we're finished today. So let's go to Philippians chapter 3, and we're going to read this to, to you from the New King James Version. This is kind of our theme segment of Scripture that we've been on for, for this month. Everyone say, I'm excited. I'm excited. Now, say it like you believe it. I'm excited. <laughs> All right. Do you know that if God's Word wouldn't be invading your life and the world that we're in, we, we would stay in a really, uh, we'd stay in a stupor. But when his word is spoken and given to us, it, it, it's going to turn some lights on in, in some situations, right? Here we go, Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. And I love this verse because this makes me feel kind of warm and fuzzy. Hope it does you too. Listen, listen to this as I read it. Not that I have already attained or I'm already perfected. Is that, did I just like read anyone's mail? You, you, you've not got it all together and you're not perfect. I mean, for the few of you that are, I mean, God bless you. You can just chill for the next few moments. But for the rest of us... How many just ever realized, I mean, I'm not there yet. Thank God I'm not who I was, but I'm just, I'm not perfect yet. So th this, is, this is what Paul's saying. I, I haven't obtained it, and I, I, I'm not perfect, but there's something I do. I keep pressing on. And there's just something sometimes to be said about pressing on, that I would lay hold of the thing that Christ has laid hold of for me. Jesus has laid hold of everything that you would want, need, or desire. He's grabbed it. So we press on to get what he's already got for us. Amen. Verse 13, it says, brethren, so we know he's talking to us. He says, I don't count myself to apprehended, but there's one thing I do. I forget the things that are behind me, and I reach toward the things that are ahead. Now, it's interesting that it says I one thing. It's actually two things. But what it means is I consistently repeat this behavior. It's a habit that I forget. I turn yesterday over to oblivion, and I press on toward the next thing God has for me. I can press on, leave that behind. And I love this. He says, I press toward the goal of, for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. We're pressing forward for the goals, the prize, the calling, all that Christ has for us. Amen. And he has some great things he's called you to. And verse 15 just says, therefore, as many of us are mature, this would be our mindset. And if anything, you would think otherwise, God will reveal this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we've already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us have this mind. So there's this mindset that the Bible, that Paul's telling us, that we should have. And the Bible says in there, and so we've learned this in this detox series. Week one, we talked about detoxing our past. Anyone have some things in the past you just like to eliminate, detox, get that away? Well, we learned this, that everybody has a what? We all have a past. But the past is in the past. And the past does not have to predetermine our future. Isn't that good news? We've just, we just detox the past. And the Bible says, forget where I've been. Then it says this, I press on. 
Well, this forgetting and pressing on is how we uh, detox the present. And we learned this, that we can detox the present by having our minds renewed. And we talked last week about having our minds renewed and transformed because our stinking thinking has to change. Your life will not change until our thinking begins to change. So you got saved, you're born again, you love Jesus, but how many know our minds need renewed? They need changed, they need altered. And so we learned how to do that last week. And so this week, the Bible says we press on to the prize. So I want to talk this week about detoxing your future. Good to have the past detox, good to detox the present, and we need to have the, the future detoxed. Amen? And the detox, remember, is just removing some toxins. How many like to have some toxins removed from your future? Well, this word, the Bible says we, we pursue that prize. This word pursue means that we run after, eagerly pursuing and running after. It's the idea how many have ever watched a show called Cops? Bad boys, bad boys, what you going to do? H- have you ever just wanted to be in that show for a moment? I mean, when they get out of the cop car and they are pursuing the criminal, h- how many kind of just, is it just me? Or you're like, this is awesome. I would just like to pull a gun and chase somebody down. Now, if you're a police officer, I know it's a little dream world for me, just let me for a moment, but they pursue that criminal. This is the same idea that you're pursuing a cop pursuing a criminal, or there's a prize that God has, and we need to be eagerly and passionately pursuing the future, the next level, the breakthrough, the next thing God has for you. Pursue it with some passion. Pursue it with some determination. It's this idea like a cop is pursuing or a hunter is pursuing his prey. He's not out there in the woods like, la-di-da-di-da-di. You're pursuing something. But a lot of us are walking into our future just like that, la di da la di da instead of pursuing the prize and the thing that God has for you. So we're going to learn how to detox that future. Are you guys ready to go? <clears throat> so I want you to think about a, a couple of questions here as I start off. When you think about your preferred future, what you want to see happen, what, what will you see God doing, what you're believing for, for God to do, when you see your preferred future, which is what we call vision, when you see your, pre- your, your preferred future, what do you see? What does it look like? Well, what, what, what's it feel like? What do you doubt? What do you fear? What do you expect? And it, it, here's the deal. Uh, we, I, I don't want that just to be a wish. But, but, but think about this. When you often try to look and see a preferred future, sometimes we struggle with that. And here's why. We have a hard time seeing past the conditions and the circumstances and the frustrations and the challenges of where we're at right now. And sometimes that clouds our ability to see what's before us because we're stuck seeing what is surrounding us. And something often happens because we have to deal with this thing called disappointment. Anyone ever had a few disappointments? Well, I... um. I was reading a, a book by uh, Brian Houston. has a little church called Hillsong, a few places. You might have heard of him. Um, he he kind of tore this word disappointment apart. And it really turned a light on for me. The word disappointment, we know if you use the, the prefix in that word and, and the uh, root word, it's disappointment. The word dis means to go against. Challenges and conditions and circumstances happening to you now can have a tendency to disappoint you or go against your appointment. There are some appointments God has for you, some places God has for you, some next levels God has for you, some other uh, places for, for God to do and take you. But if you're not careful, the disappointment can go against your appointment. And so when you try to look at your preferred future, dealing with some disappointments, we can't allow those disappointments to challenge or change what God's appointed us to, amen? Or you, you'll you stay in a rut and you'll stay there for years when we know that God wants us to move into our next season. Our, our next. So do not allow the disappointments. Isn't that a good, that's a good analogy. It can dis your appointments. And here's what happens. When you have a disappointment, you start to feel vulnerable. You start to feel vulnerable, vulnerable. And you feel like I can't go to that next level. I can't get that breakthrough. I can't go to that that, that next season. But there's nothing like disappointment in your life to reveal to you if you really are firmly settled, listen to this, in his lordship. You're going through life, you're headed somewhere, and a disappointment comes. A relationship ends. 
a career changes, a financial thing hits you, <clears throat> a health diagnosis stumbles you, <clears throat> and we're faced with disappointment, and it's at that moment when it really reveals to us whether we are following his lordship or not, whether we're trusting in his direction or not, whether we uh, put our confidence in him taking us into our future. Did I just read anybody's mail? I read everyone's mail. All right, so I'm preaching to the right, the right crowd this morning. So that leads me kind of to this point that you may nev never have heard a, a, a message on before, but there is a, an extreme difference between Jesus being your Savior and being your Lord. There, there, there's a drastic difference there. Being your Savior, anyone grateful that He's your Savior? I mean, you were lost, you were sinful, you were full of pride, you were full of self, you were on a path of self-destruction. And Christ redeemed you and forgave you and saved you. You don't have to go to hell. You have eternal security. And you're blessed because of that. And you're grateful because that He saved you. You're a different person. But that's not the end of the story. He's not just after your salvation. He's just not here to save you. He's also here to become the Lord of your life. And those are two different things. And I, I want to kind of camp on that this morning. And so I thought, how could I best explain this or, or make a point here? And, and this is what I came up with. I want everyone to think back with me. Back in the day <clears throat> when you were younger, how many know, and for some of you, uh, you probably took real advantage of this. Now, I never, but I know there's some in our crowd, Billy Spurlock would be one, that took advantage <laughs> of a situation like this. How I many know there was a difference when you were at home with a babysitter compared to if you were at home with your parents? Think about the difference. The babysitter had some rules. They were responsible to watch you for a few hours. Some of you probably terrorized the babysitter. And probably when the babysitter told you you had to do something, it was more of a suggestion to you. But when your parents came home and they gave you some rules or some chores or some directions, how many know there was a little bit different response to your parents than there would have been to the babysitter? Okay, let me help you a little more. How many know there was a, think back with me, okay? How many know there was a difference? If you're single or if you're married, you got to think back here a little bit before you're married. How many know there's, there, there's a difference between that person being your boyfriend or girlfriend versus being your husband or wife? I mean, it's just, there's some, it's just different. And you say, what's the difference? Well, rights are the number one difference in those things. Responsibility is the, the, another difference. So there's a difference between that person being your boyfriend and being your husband and vice versa, or being your parent or being your babysitter. I mean, no, there's just differences. There is a difference of right and responsibility. It's the same thing with Jesus being your Lord or Jesus being your Savior. Here's what the word Lord means, boss, ruler, and master. So he can be your savior to have rescued you from a destructive path, but is he really the ruler of your life? Is he the boss of your life? Is he the master of your life? Is he Lord and savior? Is he Lord or savior? That's a great question. And whether you're kind of new to faith or you're just checking out the things of faith or you've been walking with Jesus for a while, I, I want you to think about that. We're going to discover the answer to, to those couple questions this morning. When it comes to salvation, it's about quantity. We want as many people born again as can be. When it comes to lordship or discipleship, it's actually more about quality, the quality of your life. And a lot of us, a lot of people, a lot of believers, they want all the benefits of salvation without the responsibilities of discipleship or lordship. Now, this might be a little painful as we go along, but I promise you we're going to get to a really good place here in a few moments, if y'all can stick with me. You guys ready to go? So let's go to Luke. We're going to go to um, chapter 14, and we're going to find verse 16 here. Luke chapter 14, verse 16. This is um, the New King James Version once again, and I want to make sure I read it right here because I had a different version, I guess, than the original or in the early uh, experience this morning. So I'm going to start at verse number 16. And then he, then he said to him, a certain man gave a great supper, and he invited many. So we're finding out here people were invited to a banquet. Verse 17, and he sent his servant at supper time to say to those who were invited, come, everything is ready. 
So once again, in context, these people are being invited to something. They've RSVP'd. They, they, they promised to be there. All they're waiting on is when is it ready. You know, uh, we're getting ready probably to have some Christmas meals with family. And your family's going to sit around, ladies. Everyone's going to sit around at your house while you're slaving away in the kitchen. And they're just waiting to hear what? It's ready. Amen, all my sisters? Okay. Verse 18, but they all with one accord began to make what? Excuses. Anyone ever gotten good at making excuses? The first said, I bought a piece of ground and I must go see it. Well, how many know you don't buy a piece of ground until you've seen it? So it's an excuse. I asked that you would have me excused. And another said, I have bought five oaks and I'm going to test them. I ask that you have me excused. It's like trying a car. How many of you test drive the car before you buy it? You don't buy it, then test drive it. So once again, an excuse. Still another, and I love this one, says, I've married me a wife, and therefore I cannot come. I don't know if his wife said you can't come. I don't know, you know, what's kicked in there yet. But, but these are all excuses. Now listen to this statement that I'm about to make. And I want to say it how I wrote it down. Never let your excuses interrupt your destiny. Never let your excuses interrupt your destiny. In context, we're talking about our future, our next level, the place God's called us, the purposes God has for us. Never let your excuse. Does anyone know anyone that's just good at making excuses about everything? Never let your excuses interrupt or detour or delay your destiny or your purpose. Now, I want to look at these few specific excuses. The first excuse was, I can't be there like I promised because I've purchased some land. Well, the land represents your places. He said, I can't be there because I've got a place I've got to go look at. Here's the first challenge you're going to have when we're talking about lordship and detoxing your future. And the difference between Savior and Lord is this, is your places versus God's places. We have this thing in us that we want to make these excuses for the places we want to be when God has some better places for us to be. Whether that's your job, your career, your church, your, your relationships, whatever that might be, there's this challenge in us to be in the place we think we want to be or should be and holding on to our places versus God saying, I've got a better place for you. I've got a breakthrough place for you. I've got a different purpose for you. And we struggle with this thing and we often excuse this thing over the issue of places, our location, our land. This is my turf. This is my thing. This is my place. This is where I want to be, how I want to do things. And sometimes it's against what God has. Now, God's not out to steal your fun or challenge you in that way. But how many know God knows better? God knows best. And God's places, no matter what you might think about them now, His places are always blessed way more than your places. You might think your design, your thought, your feelings, what you want, are, but God has a place for you, and there's often this challenge between my place and God's place. And this was the first excuse. Never excuse yourself to stay in your place when God has a better place. You, you've made excuses to stay on the level that you're at when God keeps calling you up to a different level. He said, i got a different level for you. i got some different purposes for you. And you're staying on a level that you were in two years ago, six months ago, six weeks ago. And God said, I'm always calling you what? Upward toward the prize of God. Higher toward the prize of God. He doesn't go backwards. He doesn't regress. He's calling you what? Upward and higher. Don't get comfortable in your place. Be willing for God to move you up to what? His place. And I want you to know his place is higher and the view from God's place is much better than the view from your place. And a lot of times we get comfy and we get cozy in our place. In God's place, his calling may, may not be always as comfortable as where you want it to be, but it's a better place. Do not use the excuse of staying in your place. The second excuse that, that, that we see here is not the land, but it's the oxen. Now, we don't, a lot of us aren't going around purchasing oxen. I understand that. But it represents, if the first represented the place, this represents your possessions. Now, God doesn't have a problem with you possessing things or your possessions. But once again, don't get stuck in your place and your possessions when God has some way better possessions for you. And in the next place, he's got better possessions than you dreamed about in this place. Some of you got your place trying to hold on to your possessions, and God says, I've got a different place with some better possessions. You'll never experience the better possessions unless you get to God's place. That was really good. But possessions, what are you holding on to when God says, there's some different things I want you to possess. 
Are you holding on to bitterness? And God said, I want you to possess some peace and forgiveness. Are you holding on to uh, some sickness when God says, I want you healed? Are you holding on to some doubt when God says, I want you full of faith? What are the possessions that you've been holding on? Are you holding on to some hurt when all along God says, my next place and my next possession for you is total healing in your heart and your mind? Are you holding on to some regret when what God says is the next place and position for you? I want you to possess freedom. I mean, it's, it's hard to let go of some things. It's hard sometimes, but go, do not excuse yourself and stay on that level. And the last excuse, which I think is interesting here, he says, I've just married myself a wife and I can't come. Well, God doesn't want, the story's not here about conflict in, conflict in marriage. It represents people. The other excuse is just people. Place, possessions, and people. And what I mean by that, th th there are some people, let me talk to the single people for, for just a moment. There might be some, some person in your life that you're making excuses for that maybe God doesn't want in your life. Because maybe there's some loneliness, or you're feeling alone. You know, you can be with somebody and still be very lonely. And so I'm talking to the, the single people here. Do not forsake God's best for good. Well, I'm just trying to reach him. I'm, I'm just trying to reach. God has, in his place, he has possessions and he has the right people. Do not excuse yourself in a relationship that God doesn't want you to be in because he has a whole better solution for you, is what I'm trying to say. Amen? And I know that's easy for me to say, oh, you're married. It's easy for me to say. But I'm talking about maybe it's not marriage. Maybe in your life there are some friendships, some relationships. And listen to me, for God to take you to the next place and the next purpose and detox your future, maybe there are some toxic relationships. I mean, those are tough. You know, we want to be believers. We want to be good to all people. Maybe there's some toxic relationships and it's keeping you from God's place and God's best. Now, I can't tell you who, why, you'll know that, the voice of God. God's talking to you about them. I'm not talking about being mean to somebody. I'm just saying for you to get to God's next place, the next place of purpose, the next breakthrough, the next level, the next level of glory that he has for you, are you excusing some of these things and it's keeping you back from, God, from your, your preferred future? Good stuff. I told you it'd be hard for a few moments. I told you it'd be hard for a few moments. But don't let those excuses interrupt your future. Now, let, let's keep reading here. Let's jump down to verse 25. It says this. Now, were, there were these great multitudes that went with Jesus, and he turned to them. Now, think about this. You would think the great crowds, bigger church services, more people following Jesus, greater outreaches, throngs and throngs and multitude of people coming and pressing up against Jesus, the Bible said. You would think he would say, come on, come on, come on. But Jesus says something different here, and he's not talking about salvation, he's talking about discipleship. He says that if any of you are going to come to me, and, don't, and you do not hate your father or your mother, your wife or your children, or your brothers and your sisters, and even your own life, you can't be my disciple. Now, he is not saying, in context, to hate your family. What he's saying, if you, if you love you, or brothers, or sisters, or parents, or husbands, or wives, more than you love Jesus, you're not worthy to be a disciple. Don't misunderstand. He's not saying hate them. Y'all understand that. He's just saying you've got to love God more than anything or anyone else. Now look what it says in verse 27. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now he's talking about the cross. For which of you intending to build a tower would not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to war against another king would not sit down first and consider whether he's able with 10,000 to meet those who come against him with 20,000? Or else while the other is a great way off, he would send a delegation and ask for peace. Likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be a disciple." Interesting few verses here. So I said this to you. I, I said, don't let your excuses get in the way of your destiny. But I also like to say this, that lordship is really the way that will lead you into your destiny. 
See, before you were born and before you breathed your first breath, Scripture tells us that God had a divine plan for each and every one of your life. Even if mom and dad didn't have a plan for your life, they might have told you you weren't planned, you weren't expected, but God has a purpose and plan. The Bible says he even knows the numbers of the hairs on your head. He knows how many are there. He knows what you were created to do, what you are created to, 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 to be. He knows all of that. He designed you with a purpose. But the only way that you're going to get to that place or walk in those things is if he is the Lord of your life. Wouldn't you just like, uh, let me talk to the adults here with lots of responsibility. Wouldn't you just like a guarantee that someone could lead you into your future and it would be a prosperous, blessed strategy? He's in control. He's got the keys. Just take me where you need me. That's what lordship is. It's God saying, I'm going to take you to some higher places, to some better places. I might take you through a few valleys. I might take you through a few battles, but I'm going to get you to a place. That's what lordship is, is, is all about. And so we've seen the excuses. And, and then we read here that there are some questions we need to ask this morning. You guys ready for these? Some statements. So detoxing your future. Can God lead you to a higher place? Can he lead you to a place fulfilled and more purpose? Can he put you through a place of breakthrough? Yes, he can. As the Lord of your life, as the boss of your life, as the ruler of your life, he can take you to that place. But these, these are some things we have, to, we have to confirm on. First, number one, decide who holds the number one position in your life. Who holds the number one position in your life. Well, if I asked that question, we'd all be, oh, God, God's number one. He's number one in my life. And we would all answer that way. But this is really a question of supremacy. The Bible says you've got to love yourself, your mother, your father, your family, everything and everyone else less than you do Jesus. Some of those family members, that's easy to do. I get it. But, 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 but what he's saying is you've got to love everything, all of your ambitions, all of your thoughts, all of your opinions, all of your direction, all of your ambition, all of your purposes. The Bible says this, that you've got to love Jesus more than all of those things. How many know we can get real full of our own thoughts and our own opinions? And you know what he says? Here's the battle that you and I have. When you came to Jesus, you came and you had a messed up, jacked up, destructive life. You're on a destructive pattern of thinking and living and speaking. And you receive grace and mercy and salvation. You received that from Christ. It wiped away your past. It gave you a ticket to heaven. And that's wonderful. But there's something that Jesus has asked for, because that's not the end of the story. He's asking, asking for lordship. Put me number one in your life. See, you were at a place in your life where you couldn't save you. Some of you were a mess. Some of you, if it wasn't for Jesus, would not be breathing now. And you came to the end of yourself. But salvation is not the end of that process. Just like you had to, you had to just come to Christ. You didn't get it all together then to come to Jesus. You just came to him all a mess. And what he's saying is, you, you gave me the rights to your life as, salvation, as far as salvation goes. But what about you giving me first place in your life with your future? If you can put him in first place in your life and your future, and you let him drive and direct and strategize and plan and open the doors, and your job is only to walk faithfully through them, God will take you to higher places. You will have greater scenery. He will have the right people. You will possess the right things. It will be a different story than if you design the plan and take and drive the bus yourself is what I'm saying. How many know get what I get what I'm saying this morning? He'll take you to the, some places. It may take you on some turns you didn't know, didn't expect, didn't see him coming. He will get you to your place. And the thing when he's in charge, you will never peak. You will never plateau. He keeps taking you from glory to glory to glory, from level to level to level. I'm not saying it's, it's always easy, but I'm saying who's in first place? Follow the leader. So many times we're still in first place. The challenge of us as believers in following Christ is this thing we call self. Have you ever come into a situation, you love Jesus, you're serving Jesus, and just problems and challenges, and you're just like, Jesus, I can't take it anymore. Here, I'm going to put you in charge. Take me, Jesus. Jesus, take the wheel. I've never been to that place. But then when things are going smooth, I think I'll take that, that wheel back now. I can handle this. How many have ever done that? 
It's like a yo-yo. I mean, back and forth, back and forth. When, when it's challenging, Jesus, take the wheel. When it's smooth, that's all right. I'll get my lean on. I'll kick back here. And you're in charge again. Lordship means you put him in first place position. Here's the second thing that lordship means. Is recognize who is holding the keys to your life. I don't have my keys with me, but if I walked up and I just tossed you the keys, and I said, you're in charge. I go where you say I go. I do what you say I do. I follow you. It's an issue of surrender. It's an issue of surrender. This lordship thing, I want you to think about, it. Is he, does he have the keys of access and leadership in your life? Is he the boss of your life? Think about America. We don't want anyone to be our boss. Well, I'm a self-made man. Then that's the problem. Whether you figured it out or not, you need the leadership of Jesus. Put him number one and toss him the keys to your life. What if those keys in his leadership and his plan is for you to be on the mission field in Ecuador. And you're holding on to your place and your position in cozy, comfy America. Here's what you don't understand. You were designed and you were made for this place right here. And you can have everything you have in America and be miserable and frustrated and, miss, and, and dish your appointments because you haven't tossed them the keys. And you got to know something. When you're in this place, I heard someone say this, that you, you can be on the war-torn streets of a place like Iraq and be full of peace. Or you can be on the comfy, cozy streets of Disney World out of the plan of God and be in danger. Who's got the keys to your career? What you want to be versus what he's called you to be. Who's got the keys to the relationships in your life? Whether it's marriage, whether it's dating, whether it's friendship, whatever, who's, who's got the keys to those? Who's got the keys to those different areas of your life? Who's got the keys to your finances? Who, who, who owns those keys? Who's in first place? Well, I'm just doing what he tells me. What if he says, I want you to give someone a car? Give them a house. Buy their meal. Buy them a Happy Meal at McDonald's. Well, God, if that's really you, just let Donald Trump come to me, sign a check. You know, it don't work that way. But how many of you like to be at a place where you just follow God? You follow his lordship. Because usually here's how it works. He'll tell you to do something. And if it's something you could easily do, it's probably not him. But if it stretches your faith a little bit, for most of you, if God said, I want you to give someone a car, It'd stretch you. Some of you would stretch you a lot. It takes some faith. Usually it's a sign of God if it takes faith. But wouldn't you like to be in a place where you could just walk up, buy someone's meal, give them a car, bless them with something? These are the things God wants to lead us and guide us to. Isn't that cool? But see, the battle was me. Because what if God told you to go buy someone a meal? You're going to have this internal ba battle. Well, that's my Starbucks money. And if I don't get enough caffeine in me throughout the week, that's my, that's my 20 bucks for Starbucks this week. And if I don't get enough of that in me, 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 me. And here's the greatest battle you and I face. We come to Christ, we gain Christ, but we still battle with me. That's toxic. That's what we need to detox out of our future. Amen. Let, let, let me give you this last one because... This is the ouch one, this is the answer, and this is the good one all wrapped in one. How do you detox your future? Well, you decide who holds the number one position. You recognize who holds the keys in your life. And listen to this. You realize what it's going to cost you. The Bible talked to us about the cost. Figuring out what, what's it going to cost you to really follow his Lordship. And I'm going to tell you in just a moment what that cost is. I'm going to answer it for you. Remember back in school when you took the open book test? Did y'all like those? Oh, yeah, dude, the answer, you just had to find it. My, a couple years ago, my youngest daughter, she always would bring these stories home, and she had to find the answers in there. 
And then she would write them down, but the answers were there. They were just in the story. And it would start out kind of like this. Dad, can you, can you tell me what? No, the answer's right there. Dad, well, I can't find it. It's not in there. It's right in there. Just read. And this would go on for 20 minutes. Finally, I'd be like, you know what? I'm going to find the answer, go get a shower, and go to bed. Because it just went on and on and on and on. Finally, I'd say, right there's the answer. Write it down. I did the homework. <laughs> Great example, I know. But you ever wonder if God's like that? All right, you're whining, you're complaining, you're kicking, you're flopping all over the floor, wondering where the answer's at. The answer's right here. I'm going to show you what the answer is. You know what the cost of lordship is? The cost when he says pick up your cross? The cost when he says take a survey if a king's against you? Take a survey of what's it really going to cost? Here's the thing that it costs you. Obedience. Obedience is the cost. Have, have you, I'm going to pick on my kids. They love it when I pick on them. They're, they're hearing this, this experience. So um, I had this about 110, 15 pound German shepherd. The most peaceful, loving, calm, wonderful animal. And it really gave me a man card when I walked around with him. And, and he died a little over a year ago. And so we got the girls this little, totally had to turn in my man card. <laughs> 10 to 14 pound, yapping, bitey, arrogant little female dog. Probably bred in hell itself, I'm thinking. <laughs> you pick her up to put her away, she just growls for no reason. I'm like, what is wrong with this animal? And it goes a little bit like this. All right, the dog needs to go out. Well, it's her turn. I took her out last time. No, it's her turn. I don't want to go outside. It's raining outside. You take her out. And they sit there and I'm like, I said take the dog out. And this goes on and goes on and goes on and goes on. And finally, we take the dog out. And I told him one night, I said, I just want to one time say, well, someone take the dog out. And you guys fight over who gets to take her out. Oh, Father, you're such a blessing to us. I will take the dog out. I will put her on the leash. It's two feet of snow. It doesn't matter. Anything for you, I will obey. If that happens, I'll be like, <laughs> drug test right now. <laughs> but as a parent, sometimes you just wish, like, I don't need a reason, just obey. I wonder if God ever feels that way. What's it going to cost me? What's it going to cost you? Our obedience. That's our cost. That's what it costs us. It's just our Do not excuse away your destiny. But let's find out today, is he number one? Let's toss him the keys and say, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to be obedient. That's lordship. Let him lead you to his relationships. Let him lead you to his career. Let him lead you to his business deal. Let him lead you to that marriage. Let him lead you to that job. Let him lead you to that priority. Let him lead you. It's called open. What if all of us in the early experience, this experience, and everyone watching at home on the live stream, what if all of us just said, in 2016, it's not about me anymore. It's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to detox my future. I'm going to get the toxins out because I'm following Jesus. I'm going to obey him. It's not about my opinion. It's not about my pride. It's not about what I think. It's about me following Jesus. What would a believer in a church look like? What would a preacher look like? What would a worship man look like that just sold out? That's all about obeying Jesus. Let's all stand. How many got something good out of that this morning? And I said this when we started. I said this to you. That at the end of a detox, it can be a painful pattern to go through that process. But when you get out of it, you are healthier. You're healthier. When you understand the detox and your past, your present, and future, you're just a healthier person. You're spiritually healthier. I believe after you live out this series, you're spiritually healthier. Anyone grateful for Jesus? I believe this series, this, this season is more than just about him as Savior. It's about his lordship.